A reading from Reflections of L in Search of Self by Lloyd A. Green. My parents brought me up to be a good person, but there is a drive in all of us. We must explore that drive and we must feed it. That drive knows only that it wants. Dylan's Law. November 1972. 19 years old. The Wall. Envy. I believe that any decent person knows they are crossing a line and hurting someone. At least that's what I think. Being young should not be an excuse for doing stupid, selfish things. Reagan and I had been together since the end of 1969. My best friend Aaron wound up attached to Reagan's sister, Tamara, so we would all hang out together. Our times together were usually fun, and it always felt like family. But by the time Reagan and I had gotten to the end of our third year together, she talked more of finding herself. She was curious about this guy named Stan, and I had grown tired of the attention she was trying to give him. After leaving school, I went straight to Reagan's house, as I had done a thousand times over the past few years. My parents had gotten used to the fact that if I wasn't home by a particular time, I was probably at Reagan's house. If they needed me, they would call. She and I would always sit in the living room. The old reliable green couch was my favorite, with the frayed stitches around the arms of the chair. Miss Loomis had knitted brown squares of material to throw over them in an attempt to hide the worn spots. It didn't matter. What I liked was what it felt like when I leaned back. The couch knew just how to support and comfort me. Years of bottoms and backs wearing the springs down made the couch so soft that I wanted to collapse into it and not get up. After she got home, we talked about Reagan's day at school while listening to the album from the Superfly movie. Curtis Mayfield was singing the title song, and he then began to belt out the song Freddy's Dead with a strong beat. The phone rang in the back bedroom, and soon Mrs. Loomis was calling for Reagan. Once Reagan got on the phone, I could hear her chattering, and she sounded pretty excited. No, no, that would be great, Reagan paused as if to listen. Yes, okay, I'll be on time. See you tomorrow. Reagan did not return to the living room. She floated. What's happening, I asked. You remember that show that I'm helping out with? Well, Stan had said that afterwards, if I had the time, he'd like to take me for something to eat so we can talk about arrangements for the upcoming second show. Sounds like a date, I said. I raised an eyebrow and my lips tightened. No, dummy, it's not really a date, Reagan said. Stan just thinks it would be a good chance to tie up loose ends before the next one. We had all attended the same high school together, and Stan graduated when I did. Reagan was now a freshman in Hunter College, which, coincidentally, Stan was already attending. I hadn't been happy with the fact that Reagan had found her way into helping with this show. It started as something connected with the school, but I soon discovered it more likely that she was interested because Stan, the man, was running things. Didn't Reagan remember what she'd mentioned to me over the past year? Isn't Stan tall? Doesn't Stan have a nice afro? Or the number of times she said, Stan has a strong build. Reagan preached how she would always be honest with me about what was on her mind. I'll give her credit for that. I always knew what was on her mind. Whether I agreed with it was another matter. From the beginning, we agreed to base our relationship on honesty. Reagan had quickly said that I was the nicest guy she knew and eventually we would get married. There was only two things wrong with this future. Reagan also freely stated that we were still young and there were lots of people we would meet and there were experiences to be had. And two, I claimed to be truthful and I talked a good game in terms of feelings, but I still hadn't learned an important lesson. Truly being honest means there's a chance you might lose the other person. When Reagan said we were young and there, were, there was a big world out there, it all made sense. But I had my internal struggles going on. 
I was being Mr. Understanding, or I thought I should stay with Reagan because that's what my parents had done. I realized later that these were just excuses and the overall truth was that I wasn't being honest with Reagan or myself. That next evening, I had agreed to meet Reagan when she got home. Mrs. Loomis let me in the apartment after seven. Reagan had said she would be finished and back home by eight. As the minutes ticked by, the green couch and I sat quietly. I found it difficult to concentrate on my college schoolwork. I found myself looking out the ninth floor window, even though I couldn't see properly downstairs from uh, this side of the building. Building maintenance crudely did the paint on the window frames. Whoever did this sloppy job didn't take the time to use a razor to get rid of the excess. It was now after 8.30. I couldn't do my work any longer. Too distracted. I kept wondering what was taking Reagan so long. She knew I was waiting. I found myself slowly pacing the living room floor. Maybe I should go home, I thought. No, I'd probably feel worse over there. I wanted to talk to her, find out what happened. While I was trying to settle myself, the old insecurity drums started beating in my head. After three years, Reagan and I had still not consummated our relationship. We came close, but never all the way. I couldn't complain because the sexual acrobatics we would perform seemed to keep us both satisfied, but the thought of her out there exploring life was driving me nuts. By nine o'clock, I got angry. This is just inconsiderate, I thought. I had to clear my mind. I opened the front door and stood in the hallway. In front of me was the building elevator, and to my left was the stairwell door. I felt self-conscious just standing there, so I went to the stairwell. Through the stairwell window, I could hear a dog growling somewhere downstairs. The hallway was cold, and it smelled like someone had taken a piss. At least the smell seemed to be coming from downstairs. I thought I saw someone as I glanced down there, but it was only my own shadow. Instead of chasing ghosts, I reflected again on my insecurities. I knew I was a great guy but I would never be as tall, handsome, or strong as Stan was. It appeared that this was what Reagan wanted. As my anger grew, I kept staring at the same spot on the smooth beige-colored brick wall that lined the stairwell. Someone had written George and Karen in green marker, surrounded by a heart. I shouted in my head, Can't she see I'm the best guy for her? What's the problem? I felt weakened because I was forcing back tears of frustration. My fingernails dug into the flesh of my palms as I imagined Reagan and Stan together. I raised my right fist and smashed it into the brick wall three times hard. I stood there for a few seconds as tears flooded down my cheeks. I couldn't understand the problem. Why can't we just be together and be happy? Why is it so damn complicated? Where is she? I took a deep breath and then watched the mist of my breath quickly rush toward the stairs. The last time that I hit the wall, I scraped my right knuckle pretty bad. Strange, I actually felt better. I turned and walked out the stairwell and back into the apartment. It was quiet there. Guess no one knew I had stepped out. As I closed the door behind me, I could hear the ding that the elevator made when it stopped on the floor. I twisted the peephole cover at the door just slightly to peer through. Reagan had let the red elevator door go, and she and Stan stood there talking. It was about another ten minutes before she came through the door. I sat quietly on the couch. I felt like I had been in a fight. When she came in, Reagan could see that I was in a mood. Are you okay? Reagan stated quickly, sounding concerned. I'm fine, I said. I was just getting jealous because you were taking so long. You shouldn't be jealous, Reagan answered as if she were singing. Stan is just a good friend. Anyway, he doesn't like me like that. Reagan began to prattle on about what a lovely time she had had, and I couldn't remember a word she said. I knew something had changed. 
I had released my anger on the stairwell wall instead of honestly dealing with my feelings. All I could think was, here we are after three years, and I'm not happy. What am I going to do about this?